I am supposed to be speaking about blockchain and somehow, you know, have a bit of fun with summarizing 2019 and the previous uh, years of blockchain, as well as looking into the future. And I'm very happy for you to ask any questions while I'm speaking. I will not be offended. We don't have to go through all of this presentation. In fact, this presentation is way longer than 60 minutes, so probably we won't. Um, as uh, it was mentioned, just a quick thing, you know, I'm with Hyperledger, I was with other, uh, in other places as well, so if you have any questions about experiences in technology or for to you ladies, you know, how, if you want to ask how it is to, uh, to experience the uh, world as a woman in tech, I'm very happy to tell you more about it and I know that uh, Jane will also has, has a lot of experience there. So let's start with this, 20 years ago. 20 years ago, the Linux Foundation was started. Uh, and Linux Foundation was started because we wanted to create the world's largest shared um, technology investment in history. What does that mean? Um, we started with Core Linux. So Linux Torvalds, as you know, this developed this amazing operating system called Linux. And we were kind of worried because there were so many open source contributors to this project and they didn't know where to go. They only knew Linux and maybe some of the other people on GitHub. So we created Linux Foundation to provide a home and a governance infrastructure for them to come in so that if Linux decides to leave at some point, we will still be able to sustain that. And that started with Car Linux. Today we have over 120 different projects in every major industry. We always build an infrastructure, we create some kind of an ecosystem around a certain area, certain domain, and bring people together. This could be enterprises, the open source community, governments, whoever wants to participate. So some of those projects you probably know, like Node.js, Kubernetes, anybody heard about Kubernetes? Yeah, that's what I thought. So these are very big projects from a Linux Foundation. Some of the m smaller ones that I'm excited about is, for instance, Automotive Grade Linux or LF Energy that is looking at sustainable energy sources. You know, one of those big things that everybody's talking about now. So what happened four years ago? Four years ago, we created Hyperledger. And Hyperledger was an answer to, uh, from Linux Foundation to the whole boom of Bitcoin. So basically people were coming to us and saying, well, what do you want to do about this whole Bitcoin space? And Jim Zemlin, our executive director of the whole global um, Linux Foundation said, look, Bitcoin is for people who want to play with crypto. It's not for enterprises. But there is something really important about this whole technology. technology. And so we created an open source collaborative effort to advance cross-industry blockchain technologies. And uh, Linux Foundation provided us a house for or home for this. And we are again bringing the enterprises, the open source community, governments, institutions like KBA together to work and create blockchain frameworks, tool tools and libraries uh, that are useful in enterprise setting. Um, we are 100% open source, and I can't underline enough how much open source we are and how important it is for us. It is really deep in our hearts that any one of you here can go right now, download the code, use it, build on top of it, and in fact, Apache license that we are using states that you can use our code without even mentioning that you are using Hyperledger quote. So you can always build your product, your system, based on what developer community is doing. Now, of course, we would welcome you to then contribute back some of the fixes or free features that you're introducing, because that's how open source works. But if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. We won't police it. So we have a very modular approach to software projects. Um, think of Hyperledger as a greenhouse. Um, so, you know, anybody can come with a seed of idea to the community and plant it into the community. And if the community wants to um, foster it, to um, kind of b help it bloom, then it will bloom into a, some kind of a beautiful plant where everybody can um, feed from the, sword, from the fruits of it. And over the last four years, I would say that our project has grew quite a bit. 
So when I started Linux fund, uh, at Linux Foundation with Hyperledger, this is more or less how our back then umbrella, not greenhouse, looked like. And I know, Julian, you were there as well, and you remember how easy it was to explain this whole uh, concept to everybody else. So bear that in mind, this is how it looks right now. Slightly more complicated, I know. Uh, we now call it a greenhouse, and we divided it all into distributed ledgers, libraries, tools, and domain-specific projects. And I know that most of you here are developers, so I want to dive slightly deeper or give you an overview of how this whole thing works. Because one of the things that is a common misconception, especially in places where, they fo uh, where you focus only on one framework, is that you associate Hyperledger with only one thing. So people will tell me, I'm using Hyperledger. And I'm like, which Hyperledger? There are five different distributed ledgers up there. So I want you to understand the differences between those ledgers. So this, what are distributed ledgers? These are frameworks that are based, uh, basis for products and solutions. And they are different in the fair and programming language, approach to smart contracts, uh, the consensus mechanism that they use, and the governance model. And we have uh, five of them. First and foremost, obviously, you all know Hyperledger Fabric. KBA has been very involved and has been teaching about Hyperledger Fabric. It is a platform that is probably the, old, the most mature one and the oldest one that we have. It was one of the two funding platforms. So we had Hyperledger Fabric and Hyperledger Sawtooth that started this whole greenhouse. Uh, Hyperledger Fabric to today is in version 1.4.3, and we expect 2.0 alpha and beta versions by the end of the year. I think they are releasing sometime very soon. And it is by far, as I'm saying, the most mature and most popular framework. There are hundreds of pilot and production network de networks deployed. And there are very good reasons for that. Uh, it is a completely programmable platform. Um, it, is use, it supports two different smart contracts. So there is chain code, and there is uh, um, also the Solidity smart contract mechanism. It also uh, supports many languages. So that chain code can be implemented in Go, in JavaScript, and in Java as well. There are loads of uh, SDKs. The performance is quite good as well. and. I will tell you a bit more, and I know Julian will be covering even more of the use cases. And if we run out of time, just come up to me. I, I have a whole, whole book on, on use cases. Um, we have very big support as well. We, can, we see very big support from different vendors. Because Hyperledger as a project, we don't have developers on staff, and we do, don't provide uh, support, support services or consulting services. That's what other people are doing. And in fact, quite a few of them. Uh, so today, Hyperledger Fabric is all on major clouds, and you can buy blockchain as a service, or Hyperledger Fabric as a service, to be precise, from all of those vendors. But we should not forget about Hyperledger Sawtooth, which probably some of you know. I know at least two people. Anybody knows Sawtooth? Thank you. I'm glad. It's not only about fabric, though we love fabric. Uh, Hyperledger Sawtooth has been uh, brought to us by Intel. And it has a very dynamic consensus mechanism, which you can actually change on the fly. I mean, when I learned about this whole concept, I was just like mind blown. I really loved it. Um, it does support two uh, consensus mechanisms right now. One of them is proof of elapsed time, which it started with. And now it also has brought in uh, PBFT consensus. Uh, you can write smart contracts in almost any language, which is also quite useful, as you can imagine. And it does support Ethereum um, so through the Hyperledger Borrow, which is our other project. And um, the, we have something that is called Hyperledger Grid, and this is basically a supply chain example of how you use Hyperledger Sawtooth out of the box. Um, there are some really interesting features of Sawtooth, and uh, we decided to kind of uh, go through, oh, uh, sorry, uh, I missed my slide. Um, there are some very interesting pro uh, features of Sawtooth that we decided to abstract, which I'll tell you in a second. 
And as we were talking about, uh, you know, Sawtooth and support for Ethereum and Solidity smart contracts, there's something that um, I would really like to share with you, which is you might have seen, you know, this whole movement towards Hyperledger and Ethereum and Ethereum Foundation get, getting kind of closer together. And uh, we started in 2015, obviously, with Hyperledger, and then already in April 2017, so just after I joined, we launched Hyperledger Borrow. borrow <coughs> sorry. Um, and we had uh, in August already an EVM support and Hyperledger Sawtooth and then Hyperledger Fabric were supporting EVMs. Um, in October 2018, EEA joined and June 2019, so this year in June, we had the Ethereum Foundation join, followed almost immediately by launching Hyperledger Besu. Um, uh, that is a consensus project called Pegasus that was contributed to us um, from the company. Future, we will see how it, will, how it brings, but we definitely want to build an ecosystem and we are serious about it. We don't want to fight with other people. We don't want to tell you that what we do in Hyperledger is the ultimate blockchain of all. I mean, we would be killing our own babies if we said that there is one blockchain to, to rule them all. Hyperledger Besso is an Ethereum client that is written in Java and it can be run on uh, both the public and permissioned networks, which is a pretty cool idea. So you have uh, networks, that test networks like Ringby, Robson, and Gurley, uh, as well as uh, the, it does include several consensus algorithms, uh, including proof of work, proof of, of authority, um, and IBFT. Um, it is a very mature project, although it has come to us quite early because it has been a product for quite a while at Consensus before it was released to us. So uh, I highly recommend for those of you who are excited about Ethereum and permission blockchains, try, give it a try. It's pretty cool. And then we have Hyperledger Indy. Um, I'm sure all of you heard that identity is a big problem in the world and there are so many people, in fact 1.3 billion in the world, that do not have identity. Some of them live here in India actually. Um, and we want to try and help solve that problem. How? Maybe with blockchain, maybe not with blockchain, we don't know. But at least there has to be a solution that is blockchain based. So Hyperledger Indy has been launched by uh, us uh, about three years ago, so, so more, more or less. Um, the main contributor was a company called Evernim and the Sovereign Foundation. And I'm sure those of you who are passionate about identity have heard about Sovereign because they are very serious in the identity space. Um, Indy provides libraries and tools and reusable components to create digital identities. The most important thing that I want you to remember is that identity as such, identity data, does not live on a blockchain. And this is a crucial point because so many people are trying to build identity systems where they put all of that stuff, all of the private information on a blockchain and say, well, this is great, it's immutable, and we'll encrypt it. Well, encryption gets broken quite often. So you can't put any information that you're not comfortable releasing on a blockchain. You have to store it on chain, off chain and provide some kind of a proof, proofs, verifiable claims, zero knowledge proofs, however you want to do it, to the, uh, to the information that you possess and you can be responsible for. That's basically how the famous GDPR in Europe works. Um, we have Hyperledger Borrow, uh, which is a um, modular uh, blockchain client that allow, uh, helps with Ethereum support to Hyperledger Fabric and Hyperledger Sawtooth. Uh, as standalone project, it uses Tendermint and does the consensus mechanism. And finally, we have Hyperledger Iroha. Hyperledger Iroha comes from our Asian partners, so it's mostly developed in uh, Japan. Um, and it is a business blockchain framework that is designed to be very lightweight. So it runs on mobile devices. In fact, it runs on Raspberry Pis even. Uh, it is written in C++ to, for that tight memory control. Um, it is, uh, they do have a Byzantine fault tolerant consensus mechanism called TIAC, yet another consensus. I absolutely love this name. Uh, and uh, it does provide mobile SDKs. Uh, it does pro also support multi-sig uh, for transactions. And I hope, Julian, you will be talking a bit about the Bank of Cambodia use case tomorrow, which actually uses Hyperledger Iwaha. 
So then we have libraries, which are basically reusable code bases across different projects. Uh, and these are Hyperledger Ares, Transact, Ursa, and Quilt. So basically, Ares is your identity library. Transact is your transaction processor library. That's what kind of was abstracted from uh, Sawtooth uh, to make um, transaction processing a bit easier and more pal enable parallel execution. Hyperledger Ursa is our crypto library. It's really cool. It, support, it provides support from tr for trusted execution environments. Some of the some of the really cool um, curves uh, are implemented there, and so on and so forth. And then we have Hyperledger Quilt, which is our interoperability uh, project. Finally, we have tools. Um, there are three tools that um, currently we have in our greenhouse. Hyperledger Caliper is our benchmarking platform. So it is not about uh, telling, helping you to kind of evaluate if Hyperledger Iroha is faster than Hyperledger Fabric, because in ultimate goal, in ultimate terms, any blockchain can be as fast as any other. The, the reason why ones are faster or slower than the others is the setting that you do it, the way that you provide that governance, the fine permissioning, how far your nodes are apart, all of those things. So Hyperledger Caliper allows you to test your network and say, okay, this is the worst case scenario for my particular implementation. Now, should I tweak it or should I, am I comfortable with these results? And then we have Hyperledger Cello, which allows you to deploy your blockchain and operate everything around it. And Hyperledger Explorer, that allows you to inspect the transactions that are happening on a blockchain. I mentioned already Hyperledger Grid, which is the supply chain platform. It's a very young project, so we are excited to see where um, our members like uh, Cargo are taking it. And then finally, something that you might be interested in as young developers is Hyperledger Labs which is basically our R&D space. So if you have a project, you know, you went to Hackathon yesterday, you started developing this code and you're really excited about it, but you don't effectively have time to do it all on, on your own, or you think that this is something that is really valuable, you go to Hyperledger Labs. You present your code bases and have a place where you can store it within Hyperledger to build that community around it, a very global community. And it's not only young developers. In fact, yesterday, um, Accenture released their interoperability project and open sourced it uh, into Hyperledger Labs. So big companies are also using this as their space for building the community around specific project and tool. I found some really cool kind of analysis as we're, you know, summarizing 2019. Um, of how blockchain has been going. You can, I guess, see some of it. It is really interesting how, basically, first and foremost, blockchain was developed before Satoshi Nakamoto. I hope uh, you all know that by now. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, and then in 2019, we had the Bitcoin one paper, and things started going kind of from the origin all the way to applications. So we talked about transactions mostly, then we went to you know implementation of smart contracts, and now we are really focusing on the applications. So how did 2019 look for me? I used to show this slide, you know, blockchain everywhere. And then it was kind of a meme, it was funny. And a month ago, I was on a BA flight, and the British Airways has this lifestyle magazine that they have. So November 2019, on the main page, on the cover of Business Life, blockchain is up there. It's not a meme, it's actually everywhere. I couldn't really get on an airplane without seeing and talking and hearing about blockchain. And it is clear, you know, everybody wants just a little DLT in their life, <laughs> I guess. Um, the report by World Economic Forum, again, 2019, forecasts that um, there will be uh, nearly 2.9 billion um, uh, worldwide spending on blockchain-based solution, which might even go up to 12.4 billion in 2022. And it is really prevailing. I mean, we in Hyperledger are very lucky to be in a position that, to have a very global community and very strong community. So when Forbes uh, released their um, top 550 blockchain projects in the world, Hyperledger Fabric turned out to be in basis for 23 of those projects. Then we had Hyperledger Indy, Hyperledger Sawtooth, and then 21 of those projects were on Ethereum, 13 on Core, and 12 on Quorum. So some of the really big names and really big um, companies are using Hyperledger 
frameworks or DLTs for Bayesians. And we are told that we are past the blockchain spec uh, cycle, uh, past the blockchain hype in the, uh, spe uh, on the spectrum. So this was in August 2018, I believe, um, that this kind of hype curve has been presented by Gartner and said, you know, we are now officially over the hype. Um, and we now know, you know, a couple of years after, we understand that there is a spectrum of blockchains, that not there is no one type of blockchain, not one flavor. You can clearly divide the space into permissioned public blockchains, permissioned private, permission uh, public and permission uh, private blockchains. Those four types serve different purposes. And the clue is to understand your use case, understand how you need to use a blockchain, and then choose the type of permissioning and accessibility or con uh, right access control that you need for your blockchain. In 2019, we have you know, over 50 real world use cases, companies building out there and doing and earning money um, on blockchain. And there's a certain evolution of uh, blockchain technology. If you take a look at how you, how we started, you know, there was this technical experiment stage in 2008 to 2009. Then you had the, you know, all the excitement of the geeks in um, 2010 to 2012. Um, and then markets started slowly adopting it, experimenting it with it, which, you know, you can see that uh, we kind of, with Hyperledger, came towards the end of that, uh, that uh, <coughs> era. And then there was a very explosive growth. That was the last two years. Definitely we saw massive experimentation in, uh, in interest in blockchain. Now, I think that... Um, you know, 2019, 2021, it is an industrial stage. Now we are starting to kind of wake up and say, wow, this party was great, but now I have a headache and I need to do something with it. And that's where we are hitting now. We are hitting the moment of disillusion with blockchain will solve it all and or not being disilluded with the fact that blockchain will solve it all and want to see the real maturity of the pro product. So I hope that by 2022, 2025, we will have real industrial maturity and we will no longer be talking about blockchain um, as the first thing that you mentioned. You know, you have a solution and the first thing you say is, my solution is based on blockchain in order to solve X. No, I hope that one day you will say, my solution solves X. And then you'll make a and stop. And if someone asks you, so what technology are you using? You'll be like, well, in fact, I'm using blockchain. So, very different approach. And I was talking about this, you know, phase of a bit of a crisis in blockchain. 92%, uh, that's estimated by Deloitte, 92% of blockchain solutions from 2016 no longer exist. Why? Because it was all about POCs. And it was not about, kind of, we, we moved in the industry. Very interesting thing that happened was that we used to, when you build a project or a company, you had to have a product, sell the product, that's how you got money, and then that's how you got to develop your product. Now, then we move to the phase of, I need a venture capital to invest in me. So before I have any product, before I have anything actually there, I'm going to ask people to give me money, and then I'll build the product, and that's how I'll start earning the money. So, and then we had the initial coin offerings, which made the investment even easier with absolutely no product. So we live in a world where we kind of try to experiment fast and fail fast, but that also brings slight disillusionment or slight disappointment with the technology because you see, hear it, hear it everywhere, and then all of a sudden you realize, well, I've heard about all of those ideas, but they are no longer there. And I can, you know, I do have some slides on why blockchain makes sense, but I'm going to skip those. Uh, I can talk about it. In any case, I did. I was asked about some use cases, and I'm going to just quickly flash some of those uh, to you because these are products. I, I chose specifically projects where we have um, very clear uh, use cases and case studies that you can find on our website and read about all of those uh, uh, use cases. So, ethical mining on Pantalum is one that has been built by Circular. Um, it basically helps with um, making sure that. Uh, Tantalum is um, not coming from a conflict regions and is mined and transported under the OECD 
uh, approved conditions. Uh, actually, in healthcare, uh, claims transparency is, or the claims transparent uh, management is done by Change Healthcare based on Hyperledger Fabric, and that's actually one of the first uh, products that have been released based on blockchain that I know of, at least. Uh, they've been using it for two or three years now. It's kind of funny when you say, oh, it's been the oldest one two or three years. It's kind of interesting perspective. Um, one of the recent case studies that we've done uh, with um, Honeywell is the aerospace marketplace. That's something that they've released. Basically, they realized that it's impossible to find uh, airplane parts and ensure the quality of the airplane plans, uh, parts. And as you can imagine, it's pretty important to have high quality parts in your airplane because kind of people die if the, the, the parts are malfunctioning. So they created basically kind of an Amazon for, uh, for airplane plant, uh, parts that are certified and so on. We have obviously the diamond supply chain uh, company called Everledger is tracking diamonds uh, on the blockchain, making sure that they don't come again from conflict area, areas and also they um, are high quality and they are the same. Um, one as uh, you think you bought. And then we have loyalty points. That's a very, you know, it's interesting because nobody really knows that or very few people know that although we have some white papers about it. That American Express is using uh, Hyperledger Fabric to track all of the loyalty points that you're using and making sure that it is easier to um, reuse your points and for merchants to offer you kind of flexible rewards. So uh, that's about the case studies, and I promised you some glass bowl reading before we go. So let's see. Um, I looked a bit about the reports that people released. Uh, so Deloitte report, uh, report says blockchain is it overhyped, it, and it's no longer an uh, utopian dream of the crypto enthusiasts. In recent report, 53 percent of uh, more than 1,300 global executives, senior executives, identified blockchain as a critical priority for 2019. So it is, um, uh, blockchain has finally become to, of age, it's matured enough. And it is evolving into a mature solution poised to deliver initial promise to disrupt. Okay, great, I'm loving it. And then Gartner. The 2023 year is pegged as an important year for blockchain. Moving through different phases of development, Gardner envisages the technology to unlock its value by 2023. So, okay, Deloitte says that uh, it's already there, we are all using it, and then Gardner's saying, no, 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 wait another three years. And that's kind of the world there. Um, when we, we some of you may have heard of a, com a conference called Consensus. Um, it's a very cool conference in New York happening uh, yearly. There's also Invest NYC, and some of the excerpts of people that uh, have um, been to that conference. You know, Meltem Demir says blockchain is dead. Okay, so apparently there's a lot of. Uh, a lot of um, disappointment. Then Mike Alfred says, enterprise blockchain and this idea that every company is going to uh, want to have a blockchain might be temporarily on the ropes, because bl uh, but the blockchain is the foundation of what make makes the entire ecosystem work. Bitcoin blockchain has been running for more than 10 years without interruptions. It is no way dead. Okay. So then we have another one. Um, there was a boom, uh, boost cycles, and everyone's going through the thought that blockchain will be the answer to pretty much everything in terms of technological innovation. Assets insurance, trading, supply chain insurance, basically everything. And slowly what people are starting to realize is that blockchains are basically public ledgers, and it's not an efficient system. So really, there are very few things that belong on a public blockchain which I pro think is probably the most level-headed opinion out there. Blockchain will not solve it all, might solve quite a bit. So going back to Gartner, because you know, Gartner is the one, I wanted to compare a bit what, are their, what were their predictions on 2019 and how are they looking at 2020. So trends for 2019, as you can see, is autonomous system, augmented uh, analytics, AI-driven development, digital twins, empowered edge, immersive technologies, 
blockchain, smart spaces, digital ethics, ethics and privacy. That's an important one that I haven't seen enough of yet. And quantum computing. Okay. 2020. Hyper automation, multi experience. I love how they are coming with all of these new names. Like, you know, every year it turns out that I actually don't know any English. Um, democratization, human augmentation, transparency and traceability, the empowered edge, the distributed cloud, autonomous things, practical blockchain, and AI security. So, one thing, if you note there, we don't have ethics anymore, which I feel quite um, discouraged with. Uh, I think that it is incredibly important to consider the impact of technology on human lives and on how it might uh, change our society. We have been developing um, industries and technology without thinking what will happen next, what will happen in 20 years. We kind of are like, wow, this new thing, it's awesome here, right now. And then 20 years later, we realized that, like with the internet, you know, we designed internet to be really cool back then, and now we are paying for it by having all of the, our data revealed and everybody controlling what we have. And if you compare those two top trends, you still see quite a few of, um, kind, of, of, of kind of similarities. So autonomous things versus autonomous things, empowered edge versus empowered edge, and blockchain versus practical blockchain. So we are moving towards being practical. So just, you know, if I were to do put some bets on it. I think that the first thing that will happen in 2020 is that buzzwords will all buzz together. What I mean by it is that we will see combination of artificial intelligence, distributed ledgers, machine learning, walking, uh, working all together to create smart cities, smart meters, smart everything. But finally, we will hopefully recognize that these are technologies that have to work together the same way that you put together you know, your database system with your operating system and with something else. It's just about the whole solution. I hope, this is not my bet, this is my hope, that security will start coming first. That we will no longer design a system and then think, how do we patch the holes? Because the system wasn't designed correctly, because we were not thinking about security and the consequences of what we're doing. But we will start thinking first of how to design a secure system that preserves privacy. And third thing is that I think that what we will understand is that I guess because money matters, collaboration e matters even more. In the distributed ledger systems, it is not about you and your company. It is about peer-to-peer -peer network, where you have peers, where you have people that you can exchange information to create that distributed ledger. Without that, you're on, on your own in your sandbox and you can't really play with anybody else. So if you want to play on a blockchain, be nice and work with others. And then two other predictions that, well, they are not really predictions. They are pretty cool facts that I know will happen in 2020. So that I found yesterday night, I just put it in last minute, which is it, LinkedIn data shows that uh, there is very high demand for blockchain developers in India. So thank you, KBA, for actually educating the new wave of the developers um, in for Indian market and uh, the emerging markets uh, report shows that there is a high demand for blockchain developers and artificial intelligence specialists in India and we know that India is pushing development of blockchain in the country which is great and then I know of one more thing that will definitely happen so in March 3rd to 6th we will have our Hyperledger Global Forum and it is our open conference for all of the developers, everybody that wants to come in, business people as well. We have 70 different uh, talks over three days. We have workshops, we have panel discussions, not that many panel discussions, but workshop demo sessions, keynotes, and so on and so forth. So it's a really, hopefully, really great event. And it, was, it is my pleasure to tell you today, and you are first to learn that, that Kerala Blockchain Academy agreed to be our 
social supporter and social spo community sponsor to help us promote the uh, event and bring as many people from India and from Kerala as we can to raise the awareness of the amazing things that are happening in Kerala. So thank you so much for partnering with us. And with that, I would ask you to how, to what do you, how do you see the future? Thank you. So I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but I'm always happy to take questions if you have any. Oh, there is one. I'll repeat your questions so you can. Hello, yeah. Hi, I'm Ishan. I'm from Tamil Nadu e Governance Agency. Uh, so, the question that I have is so it's great to see that all these large enterprises are contributing to open source blockchain software, and Hyperledger is leading the initiative. My question is that a lot of these projects that get implemented and uh, are implemented in some sort of a production scale. Uh, we never get to know what were the best practices that were followed, right? So how they were implemented, what security protocols were followed. So is that something that comes under Hyperledger's purview or do you look to something like uh, ISO probably defining those norms and those standards? Because I believe Enterprise Ethereum Alliance tried to do something like this, but I guess it did not work. Uh, I'm not really sure what the status is right now. Sure. So, uh, well, I guess you all he heard the question. What is the uh, Hyperledger's approach to best practices and standards? Uh, that's basically what it boils down to. Um, we want to create the uh, reference code rather than uh, guides and documents. So by creating things like Hyperledger Ursa, we're saying, you know, use this library. It is definitely a safe play, a safe thing to do if you want to implement your security through your blockchain solution. We do have working groups uh, and special interest groups which discuss different aspects of blockchain in different industries. So, you know, you have your healthcare, supply chain, public sector, special interest groups. Um, and we have a group that works on developing kind of a reference teaching material, uh, which is called the uh, Education and Learning Materials Development uh, Working Group. And I know that KBA is very heavily contributing there. Um, and in fact, in terms of the standards, there are quite a few standards out there. And there are two different uh, aspects of thinking about standards. So on one hand, you have ISO, you have EEA, and EEA is doing a really good job. And we are, in fact, Hyperledger Avalon uh, is one of the uh, tools that we've just launched, which actually comes as an implementation of the token standard, tokenization standard that EEA produced. So they produced the standard and we did the implementation, kind of. That's the collaboration that we're having there. So we believe that they are doing a pretty good job in, in um, implementing all of that or defining all of that. But there is also a question of how early do you want to define a standard, right? Because if you define a standard and it's not tested well enough, then it's useless. And so you might limit the development. So where I'm coming from is, so you always get to hear about these projects, right? So MasterCard has implemented a B2B remittance mm -hmm. payment gateway, or somebody has a set up a diamond supply chain. But that's all you get to know, right? There are a lot of, I'm sure a lot of problems are being solved when these projects are implemented, right? And a lot of answers come out from these projects. So that knowledge never ends up in the public domain, in my experience, I mm -hmm. might be wrong. So, so is that something that Hyperledger is looking at documenting or uh, yes. so, uh, is it well, outside? I, I encourage you to look at our um, case studies. So on our website, www.hyperledger.org, yeah. if you go to resources, right. you will have case studies under the resources. And these are documents that we are producing with um, some of our members uh, to highlight what they're doing in production. So all of those co th these discussions are in production. But there are also parts there. Um, I'm actually running the program, so I know uh, that I am asking those questions of, you know, what were your challenges? How did you set up your network? How is it working? And so on and so forth. Obviously, you know, in a five pager, you can't describe the whole system oh, and some of it is proprietary yeah. d d discussion. But go check out those. And if you have any input, then email me and I can also kind of improve that. And we are also launching a webinar ser series for our members. Well, 
it will be public, but our members will be uh, presenting there where you will be able to also hear about their, their work and ask those questions. Sure. Thank you. While talking about this uh, particular topic, I mean, this is uh, going to be really important uh, when, we, when we discuss how do we trust this particular technology, right? So people have, uh, so one point that he was mentioning, where is that focus on letting every details of trusting this technology is? Mm -hmm. Like you, you project, okay, these are the standards that are used and these are the best practices that are used. Mm -hmm. And this should be the standard that should be emulated at every stage when implementations of any use case is done. So Hyperledger should also be projecting itself and getting all these things, not just use cases, not just uh, a one pager on that, but then the, all these best practices to be documented and projected and uh, maybe uh, LinkedIn uh, messages or Facebook messages which says that okay this is how it has to be done so I think that should be how you should look at future so I, I think you, uh, maybe you. you have comments on that thank you for that um, suggestion I guess that uh, some of it is again you know we are focusing on code uh, we are not focusing on on just white papers this community is open. We have architecture working group, uh, so you're welcome to join that group. We have identity working group. You're welcome to join that. It's, they are all open to public. So if you have suggestions about how these things should be um, documented, please join us. It's, it's a community effort, right? In terms of you know, uh, giving some guarantees, all of our frameworks as they go into pr production versions, so when we say that Hyperledger Fabric or Hyperledger Sawtooth is production ready or is in 1.0, we do a lot of uh, testing. So we actually uh, partner with uh, some of the best um, uh, security teams out there that analyze the code and do the, call. we have a bug bounty program, so if you're a hacker, please hack our code. I would be very happy if you find bugs uh, because, and you get paid for it. So it's really great because we really want that code to be verified and tested. So as far as we know, the code that we are releasing comes with, at least the ones in production, comes with some guarantees of, yes, this is secure, this has been tested, it passes CII badges and all of that. But I understand that this is more about the business side of things and the best practices. You can even propose a new working group that will be best practices working group if you'd like. Can I speak? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm Dr. Siddiq Muhammad from Canada, uh, founder of uh, Canada Blockchain Summit Limited. Mm -hmm. uh, see, uh, I would like to ask one, one thing. Why blockchain is not becoming a mass revolution, just like the internet conquered the world in the 90s. That's one thing. Uh, what we have to do uh, to reach this uh, wonderful technology, the most uh, uh, useful technology to humanity, to all the people in the mm -hmm. world, just like internet. Second thing, I heard that uh, once the quantum computing come into effect, mm -hmm. it can unlock all the passwords of blockchain. So there is a uh, speculation happening like that. So I would like to know more thing about from you. And also, uh, we, uh, you talked about this, your event in Arizona, America. Mm -hmm. So how we can promote it and uh, what is the, how is the attitude of uh, US government towards uh, blockchain technology, uh, cryptocurrency and all. So I would like to know. So the first question is about how can we make a blockchain revolution. Yeah. Uh, the second question was about the quantum computing. The quantum computing, and the third question I don't quite understand. Yeah, the American attitude towards uh, blockchain oh, and how we can. Okay. Yeah. So um, let's see. Uh, first thing uh, with the revolution, I was just actually checking because I was reading another article, but I closed it by now, so I can't show you. Um, another LinkedIn article, no, no, it wasn't LinkedIn article, it was uh, in some kind of a newspaper article, talking about how blockchain is uh, an evolution rather than a revolution. And we are moving from the year of disruption to a year of actually just ev ev um, evolving our projects and programs. And I think this is very important because if you talk to Indian government, if you talk to whatever, um, 
JP Morgan Chase, if you will, they don't want to be disrupted because disruption means destroy, d d being destroyed. You don't want to absolutely destroy key institutions out there, you know, your SWIFTs and so on and so forth, and your governments, just because there's this new shiny technology that, honestly, I mean, I believe in blockchain, but I can't give you a guarantee that it is the ultimate technology out there. It's too early. And the same way you say that internet was a, a revolution. It has been a revolution from the perspective of the last 20 or 30 years that we've been working with it. Back in the time when it was happening, it was happening very slowly. I mean, I remember, I'm 31, right? So, and I've had, I started my, when I was growing up, computers, at least in my country, in Poland, were slowly starting to become more and more popular. And I never felt like it was a, a, a revolution. I got my first computer and I could write something on it. And then slowly the internet came and it was kind of slow and okay, I could search something and it was easier. Maybe my parents said something about like, wow, you know, now you don't have to go to the library. But nobody, as far as I remember, was talking about this massive revolution and now everything will be turned around. It was more of a, okay, how do we use it? How can we improve it? So. I actually don't want a blockchain revolution. I want people to start adopting the technol this technology and analyzing how can we make it better, safer, and more ethical. Oh God, sorry. Uh, and more ethical, if you will. Now, in terms of quantum computing, I mean, I don't know when quantum computers will come. Uh, that's first. Second, the way that uh, most of the blockchain uh, is blockchains are created today. Um, is that the, secure, the encryption algorithm used can be fairly sh uh, quickly swapped, so you will be able to replace the encryption or kind of patch it into a different project. There are some projects out there that are looking at post-quantum crypto, because it's not like it will be an apocalypse day and quantum computer will emerge from the like, middle of this, um, of this room and all of a sudden all encryption will be just dead and will never be able to recover again. It's quite different. It is, again, a slow process. We are able to be prepared on it. There are some amazing companies that are looking at how to design systems post-quantum and with qua using quantum uh, computing actually in our advantage and in the advantage of cryptography. Um, you can look up uh, quantum, quantic, no, crypto tiki, crypto tiki, I think that's the name of the company. They are doing some really cool stuff that I've read about recently. And then the third question about the US approach to blockchain and cryptocurrencies. I can't speak for the American government. I am in no way associated with the American government and I don't even li live there anymore. Uh, so I don't know what's the approach there. I think that the, the very kind of in-depth, uh, or th the way that the government is approaching is, is they are trying to regulate it. So, you know, FDA is looking at how to kind of fit cryptocurrencies and uh, all of that into the realm of uh, leg leg legal aspects of, of the country, which is great. I think that we do need more regulation because without regulation, serious companies will not feel comfortable using uh, this technology. Because, um, you know, if you, you don't know what will happen in three years' time after you actually implemented something, then you might be better not implement it right now because you might be losing your game. Um, but uh, in terms of blockchain as such, there is a lot of going on. Um, the, when you're saying you're from Canada, uh, government of British Columbia uh, is actually using blockchain or uh, Hyperledger Indy as basis for something that they call org, org book, which is a registry of all of the companies uh, in government of, or in British Columbia, where you can verify the identities of it and um, kind of the legality of, of, of the company itself. And uh, th there are several other projects in our public sector special interest groups. We have people from Chicago, from, from, from the state of Illinois, from other government uh, states in the US that are working together to look at blockchain and uh, and so, so on. So I think it's th there is no negative or positive global approach. I guess it depends on the individuals and it depends on the states. It's kind of, you know, comes from what kind of group of people, like in Kerala, right? We have a group of people that really believe in blockchain. So now Kerala has a very positive approach to blockchain. So now you can project it to maybe other states in India and maybe India will be the next big country to adopt blockchain. But 
it really depends, right? It's all about people. <laughs>